In the United States National Park System alone, there are more than 84 million acres of preserved woods, desert, mountains, and other wilderness. So it's no surprise that in the past 100 years, there has been a number of cases of hikers going missing. Many of those who vanished were young children and inexperienced hikers, but some were healthy and seasoned outdoors people. But is there more to these disappearances than just kids wandering off, or hikers becoming disorientated? Hi everyone and welcome back to the Dark History Podcast. Hope everybody is well. I'm Rob, your host as always. For episode 19, we're going to look at some of the stranger cases of missing people in America's national parks. Some of these are enormously mind-bending, and I'm excited to share them with you. Yes, I know the missing 411 is a thing, and some of you may have heard these before, but I'll go through a couple of separate stories, and maybe we'll do a couple of parts of this. So without further ado, please sit back and relax for more Dark History. On December the 1st, 1946, Paula Jane Weldon decided to take a break from studying and go on a hike on the long trail in Vermont's Glastonbury Mountains. Prior to leaving, the 18-year-old college student confirmed her plans with her roommate, and she was seen by several witnesses walking along the long trail. She seemingly vanished at some point along the way, and was never seen again. Born in 1928, Weldon was the eldest of four children. She and her family lived in Stamford, Connecticut. However, during the school year, she lived on campus at Bennington College. She was a typical young woman with an interest in botany and the arts. She specifically enjoyed oil and watercolour paintings, as well as sketching in charcoal and pencils. She also enjoyed playing the guitar and spending time outdoors camping and hiking. Weldon was a responsible student who worked in Bennington College's dining car and dedicated much of her free time to her studies. On the day of her disappearance, Weldon had worked two shifts in the dining hall and spent the majority of the afternoon studying. According to her roommate, she eventually said she needed a break and wanted to go hiking for the remainder of the afternoon. Paula Jane Weldon left her Dewey Hall dorm room at approximately 2pm. She was wearing a red parka, jeans, white sneakers and a wristwatch with a black band. But it was noted she was not dressed appropriately for the cold weather. She also left with little or no money. A witness said that they found Weldon hitchhiking near the Bennington campus and agreed to give her a ride at 2.45pm. The man said Weldon wanted a ride to Glastonbury Mountain where she planned to hike the long trail. The man dropped Weldon off approximately three miles from Route 9, where she planned to enter the trail. It's believed that Weldon eventually made it to her destination, as several witnesses reported she was walking along the trail later that same day. One witness in particular spoke with Weldon at approximately 4pm. The teen stopped to ask the man about the total length of the trail before continuing along her way. The encounter was the last reported sighting of Weldon before she vanished. The sun set approximately one hour after the man spoke with Weldon. Within an hour, it began snowing and the accumulation was reported to be around three inches. Weldon's roommate became concerned when she didn't return from her hike, but she was not reported missing until the following Monday. When she failed to attend the scheduled classes, the university called Paula Jean Weldon's parents to see if she had heard from her or if she had returned home. She was reported missing when her parents confirmed they didn't know anything of her whereabouts. All students at Bennington College were required to sign out if they planned to leave the campus and must return after 11pm. They were also required to check back in upon the return. However, there was no record of Weldon checking in or right on December 1st 1946. In addition to the Weldon's family and friends, the Connecticut and New York State Police Departments began searching the Long Trail and surrounding regions. Initially, authorities assumed Weldon simply got lost or injured along the trail and ultimately died of exposure. However, despite conducting an extensive search, 
No trace of Weldon was ever found on or around the trail. In the hours after her disappearance was publicly announced, a waitress in Fall River, Massachusetts contacted authorities to report seeing a woman matching Weldon's description in her diner where she worked. The waitress described the young woman as appearing disturbed. However, there were a few details available about the encounter or the young woman's specific state of mind. Another theory suggests Paula Weldon was depressed and may have either run away or committed suicide. According to some accounts, Weldon was considering changing her major from art to botany, but was struggling with this decision. She was feeling somewhat depressed in the days or weeks prior to the disappearance. However, they did not believe she was severely depressed. Weldon's parents disagreed with the theory that she may have run away or committed suicide. Instead, they suspected her boyfriend may have been involved. Weldon's father, in particular, did not approve of the relationship, but the only thing linking the boyfriend to Weldon's disappearance was a report from a psychic. Although authorities did not consider the boyfriend to be a likely suspect, her father was insistent that they continued following that lead. The dispute ultimately led to the breakdown in relationship between Weldon's father and the authorities investigating her disappearance. One of the more compelling persons of interest in Weldon's disappearance was a man named Fred Gadetti, who worked as a lumberjack and lived near the trail where Weldon vanished. In 1955, Gadetti went to authorities and confessed to having information about the teen's disappearance and knowing where her remains were buried. However, he later recanted the confession and claimed he was simply seeking attention. Gadetti also reportedly bragged to others that he attacked and killed Weldon. Whatever the case is, to this day, not a trace of Paula Jean Weldon has been found. On November the 18th, 1928, Glenn and Bessie Hyde said goodbye to brothers Elworth and Emery Kolb. They left the Kolb's house near the Grand Canyon's Bright Angel Trail and began walking down the path leading to the Colorado River. The Hinds had a boat tied up there, one in which they'd spent weeks floating down the rapids in the Green and Colorado Rivers on an extended honeymoon trip they began the previous October. Henry Kolb's younger daughter appeared just before the Hinds walking out of sight, and Bessie remarked on the smartly dressed little girl's outfit. I wonder if I shall ever wear pretty shoes again, Bessie said aloud. Then the couple resumed their walk, boarded their boat and shoved off into the Colorado River. And they were never seen again. On the 10th of April 1928, Bessie and Glenn married. She was 23 years old, he was 30. Glenn had an unusual idea for a honeymoon. He and Bessie would build a skull and run the rapids from Green River, Utah through the Colorado Rapids in the Grand Canyon and conclude their expedition in Needles, California. Today you can drive between the two cities in 7 hours and 15 minutes. In 1928 it took a bit longer to travel on the Colorado River. In fact, nobody had ever done it. Glenn expected that he and Bessie would succeed and ride the publicity trail of other popular heroes like Amelia Earhart and Charles Lindbergh. Bessie would be the only woman ever to make the trip, and Glenn one of the very few men. With the help of experts, Glenn built a 20 foot skull he called Rain in the Face in two days. The couple set off down the canyons of the Green and Colorado Rivers on October the 20th and expected to reach Needles, California by December 6th, about three weeks from the start of their journey. Initially, they made good time, travelling about 10 miles a day and crossed the Soap Creek Rapids in a record time. Soap Creek offered a preview of what was to come, with its turbulent water rushing around the rocks and boulders with sheer canyon walls looking on. After 26 days out, Glenn and Bessie arrived at the Bright Angel Trail, setting another record. They stopped and hiked out to the South Rim to visit Emery Kolb, a 
photographer who arrived at the south rim of the Grand Canyon in 1911 and probably knew more than anyone about the canyon. Emre had been down the rapids twice. Emre gave the couple sound advice. He said that their boat wasn't safe and that they should stay with him for the winter. Glenn refused. Emre offered them life jackets and again Glenn refused. It's said that then Bessie was tired of the trip and the boat which often needed to be repaired. Nevertheless Glenn and Bessie departed for the next leg of their journey on November the 18th. On December the 6th Glenn's father was waiting for his son to arrive in Needles and Glenn and Bessie were late. Mr Hyde, worried, persuaded authorities to start a search. Two army observation planes took off from March Field in Riverside, California and on December the 19th the flyers spotted a boat that seemed to be adrift near River Mile 237, now also known as Honeymoon Rapids. A rescue party set out by land and located the skull. It was upright with supplies strapped in place. Bessie's camera and journal were in the boat, but there was no sign the skull had overturned or been battered by the rapids. There was no footprints, no remains were found downstream. So what happened? Did Glenn and Bessie drown? Had one of them been washed overboard and the other made a rescue attempt? Perhaps hypothermia set in while they were in the water and killed both sailors. After all, they had no life jackets. Or perhaps more nefarious events took place. Did Emery kill Glenn in an attempt to save Bessie for himself? After Emery died in 1976, skeletal remains were found on his property. There was a bullet hole in the skull, but the remains turned out to belong to a man who committed suicide in the park. So if Emery didn't kill them, did Glenn kill Bessie? It was unlikely at best. Maybe Bessie killed Glenn. Equally improbable. However, in 1971, a woman joined a whitewater rafting expedition. When the guide told her the story of Glenn and Bessie, she said she was Bessie and that she had killed Glenn. After she returned home, the woman denied ever telling the story. What is for certain is Glenn and Bessie Hyde have never been seen again. Perhaps ever weirder than any of these cases are those in which a person has vanished only to reappear later, unable to explain what's happened. An earlier case of this is that of two-year-old Keith Parkin, who in 1952 was visiting Ritter, Oregon to stay at his grandfather's rural and remote ranch. The area was surrounded by forest, but Keith was allowed to play out in the yard, and on this day that is where he was. His grandfather constantly checking up on him. At one point the grandfather looked outside expecting to see the boy playing as he had just minutes before, but he was nowhere to be seen. Like in other cases we've looked at, a massive search was launched, made all the more urgent because there was a frigid bad weather set to hit that evening, which it was thought such a young boy wouldn't be able to survive. When nightfall came, little Keith Parkins had still not been found, and it was considered puzzling that he could have gotten so far, so quickly, without a trace. The search went on all night, and when morning came, they finally located the boy, alive, laying face down on a frozen pond, around eight miles through rough wilderness, from where he had gone missing. Bizarrely, he had taken his jacket off, despite the intense cold, and his clothes were ripped, although there was no sign of physical injury. It was a complete mystery as to what had happened to his clothes, why the jacket had been removed, or even how he'd managed to survive at all. And even odder still was that considering his young age and intimidating terrain, it was estimated it only took him 20 hours to cover that distance. How could this be? Was he abducted? And if so, why? A survival expert named Les Shroud deemed it impossible for a two-year-old to have covered that distance in that time had passed, in that weather, in the dead of night, making it all the stranger still. 
It would help if Keith had been able to explain what had happened, but he was either unwilling or unable to elaborate. And his strange disappearance and reappearance remains an enigma. So there you go, just a couple of stories in this part. If you enjoyed it, I'll do a few more. As a person who likes to research and read, these stories do fry my brain. These people are there one minute and gone the next, and it's the not knowing that makes my head hurt. Obviously, there is some sort of rational explanation for it. It can't always be aliens and the bogeyman, can it? As I put more stories out there like this, you will see that people generally do just disappear. But some are found in strange places, sometimes alive, sometimes dead. Sometimes they've eaten in the last two days and have just perished, but they've been missing for weeks, months, sometimes years. Anyway, if you like the episode, please drop us a five-star review. If you think your friends and family may like it, share it with them. Links to TikTok, YouTube, Insta and the show email are below. If you've been listening for a while, why not subscribe? Please do that, and then you never miss an episode. So without that all the way, please join me for episode 20 and more Dark History.